Julie Whitman. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm with College Inside Track, but for the purposes of tonight, it also might be helpful for you to know I'm a mom of five. We did this five times. I am not a college bigot. One of my kids did not go to college, so I don't think every kid needs to head off to college. But if your kids are heading off to college, it's good to understand how the con college landscape actually works. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. There's some big um, behavior changes on parts of the college. There are also some process changes that I want to make you aware of so that you are in the know for the behind the scenes stuff. Oh yeah, uh, everybody have a pen. There is, um, I invited you, paper, that's nice. Um, there is a piece of paper inside your folder too if you just want to take notes on it. Um, I'll tell you now in advance, I am happy to share this presentation with you, so don't feel like you have to take pictures of it and make copies and you know drawings on your papers. <laughs> I'll just give you the presentation, I'm happy to do it. Um, College Inside Track helps families navigate college search. We've been doing this for 17 years. Our purpose is always the same when we work with families. It is to make sure that the student finds the right fit schools for them. And we would define right fit as the right academic fit for the student, the right social fit, just rip it open, it's all good. <laughs> the right social fit for the student, um, because kids are people on campuses, right? They have to go there, they have to live there, they have to be a person 24 hours a day on this, at this place. Um, and then also the right financial fit for the family. And so what we do is blend all of those things, the things the students want and the parents want for their students, along with the budget piece of that. And uh, I'm gonna assume you guys all have high schoolers, that's why you're here. Um, and so you know that college search can be stressful. Um, do you have a, like a student on the rise? <laughs> you're here for the early crowd, I get it, I get it. Um, one of the things um, that I'm sure you all know, because you have um, high schoolers or soon to be, um, is there's a lot of messaging that floats through our high, school or, uh, high schools today that just puts a lot of pressure on the students around college and college search. And so one of the things we try and do is just alleviate some of that stress as well. So that kids are working on the things they should be working on and not worrying about things that don't matter or that they can't control. All right, we'll start tonight with quiz. Let's see how smart Dana is. Um, as a percentage, how much do you think tuition has increased at our public institutions? So these would be our state colleges and universities since 1993, so the last 30 years. Do you think it's gone up 73%, 106%, 180%, or 213%? Anybody at 73? Oh, it's a cynical crowd tonight, okay. <laughs> well, let's uh, start with 106. Okay, I have the room, 180. Couple people, and the most cynical in the room, are you at 213? <laughs> <laughs> well, it turns out, you are correct, 213%. Um, by comparison, private schools have gone up a whopping 415% in that same time frame. However, before you get out your wet noodles and start lashing those private schools for that outrageous increase, I want you to take a look at our public flagship universities. They have far outpaced their public peers and even tripled in some cases their private peers, our very own University of Minnesota sitting at 570%, right next door University of Wisconsin sitting at 1,047% tuition increases over the last 30 years. The highest I found so far is UConn, University of Connecticut at 1,300%. So I think it's important today, and we're gonna talk more <laughs> about this. This is my current pub, my current soapbox that I'm hanging out on. Um, I think today it's so important to keep in mind that um, public and private really in the current landscape does not matter even a little bit. What matters is can the schools get you to the prices that you would like to pay at the end of the day. And we're going to talk more about how you start to figure that out as we go through today. I sit down, I chat college with families. Um, Kyler was asking me if presenting is what I do all day and I said, 75% of my job is actually spent talking one-on-one -on -one with families, uh, and then I do this another 25% of the time. But um, when I sit down and chat college with families, I just want you guys to know that your kids bubbling up one of the top four schools on this list 
or schools that fall in that same class, like lots of kids bring up to you Chicago when they live in the Midwest. If they live in the South, they talk about rice, right? Um, all of the schools, I want you to notice price tags here that go along with those colleges. And um, today, NYU, most expensive school in the country, topping the ranks at $90,000 a year. Um, the ones I want to point out here, though, are the bottom three. And the bottom three are the public flagship schools of their states, right? So if you are a resident of the state of California and your student can get into Berkeley, because it's hard to do that if you're a resident, um, but um, if they end up going off to Berkeley, it'll be 40 grand a year, basically, to send your kid to the public institution, right? Um, our very own University of Minnesota is sitting around $32,000 roughly a year now. And that's what you see traditionally at the public schools. They're hovering in that thirty to 35000 Some <coughs> outliers, like University of Iowa, is still less than thirty. dollars um, UC Berkeley, more than thirty-five. dollars But um, most of them hang in right in that space. All right, you guys did good on that last quiz. Let's try this one. What percentage of students change schools at least one time? So they get to their college, discover this is not the right place for me to hang out, and they've got to go someplace else. Is it 6%, 14%, 25%, 38%, or 42%? So, thoughts? Does that include PSEO in some Uh-huh, it does include all of those. Uh, not PSEO, not the high school kids, right? But the started at a two-year changeover to a four-year. Yeah. 38, 42. 25%. Okay, so you guys are in the upper ranks. The national trends for eight today sits at 38%. So here's the thing. For those kids that start at the two-year school, um, with the intention of jumping to a four-year university, only 20% of the kids for whom that is the goal actually make the leap. And then the other thing we see is that when kids do make the leap, it increases the cost of their degree. Right? Um, there's so much outline that that transfer does not account for. Um, and this is just the financial outcome. Right? There are all kinds of not as well documented, not as much talked about social implications to transferring colleges. But um, I think it's important today to understand that when your student goes from school A to school B, they have lost their business value to the college. And at the end of the day, colleges are businesses. And when they make an acceptance decision, it's a business choice. And when they decide to give away money, it's a business choice. And so when kids transfer, they've lost that value. And so what you see are really low merit packages, if they get anything. Usually transfer kids are also in school an additional eight months, right? So now they're still paying for school and not earning income. There are all kinds of factors associated. Here's an interesting fact. Of the 38% who make a poor choice the first time, 45% of those kids make a poor choice yet again, and end up changing schools yet again. Increasing the cost of their degree by $24,000. So today, the stakes are high, right? Right fit first time, super important. Which means that your kids can't be making decisions about where they want to go to school based on cool campus and great sports teams to follow, <laughs> right? They've got to go deeper. All right, so we're going to jump into aid. Any questions about that first area? Okay, so let's chat about the kinds of financial aid available to families. Um, and I think first it's important for you to understand what colleges think of as financial aid because it's different than what families are thinking about. So um, I sit down, I chat college with families, and they'll one of the very first things out of their mouths often is, wow, we're not going to qualify for any financial aid. And what they're really referring to, of course, is need-based aid. Um, but when the colleges talk about financial aid, they are not just including need-based aid. So when you go out to a college website and you see that the average student pays X on our campus, or you see a statement like um, uh, the average award amount on our campus is X, you need to know that it is including three things. The first is need-based aid. And so already, if your family will not qualify for need-based aid on that campus, 
that number they're showing you all, already irrelevant. It's not going to reflect your number. Because the average student on any college campus is getting some percentage of need, right? Because what's an average kid? They take the kid paying the highest price and the kid paying the lowest price, and that lowest price kid is for sure getting need-based aid, and the average is somewhere in the middle. It is also including merit-based scholarship dollars. So these are scholarships that the colleges are giving away to attract a stronger student. But guess what it also includes? It also includes loans. So if your family philosophy is we don't plan to take out loans, already those numbers, irrelevant to you because they're including the federal student loan program in those numbers. If your student is not going to get the average amount of merit scholarship dollars on that campus, it's irrelevant. Your student might get more, they might get less. Right? So the numbers that they show you on the college campuses are really not very close to what it's actually going to cost you. Have you ever seen those um, uh, airline ticket ads, right? It's like go to Mazatlan for $200 and then you get out there and you discover like, oh, well, I've got to fly at this time under this carrier and do this thing and this thing and this thing and then I can get the $200. It's kind of like that. So let's talk about need-based aid first and then we'll jump into merit scholarship dollars. So there are two forms that your family will fill out to determine if you have need on a college campus. Most people are familiar with one. It's called the yeah, thank you, the FAFSA. Um, some schools use a secondary form called the CSS profile, and then some schools use their own financial aid forms. The FAFSA and CSS profile kick out a number called the Student Aid Index. How many of you already have a student in college now? Anybody? Okay, good. Um, so this is brand new verbiage this year. The 2024 FAFSA has the brand new verbiage on it. Prior years, this was called the expected family contribution. So my first tip, we're gonna do four tips tonight. My first one is get a hold of a FAFSA forecast tool and understand whether or not you will actually be need-based. Here's what I find is people are really poor predictors of whether they qualify for need-based aid. Um, most people I meet with assume if I have a house over my head, I will not qualify for need-based aid, right? Um, and that's just blatantly untrue. You may not qualify for federal need-based aid, so you may not get a Pell Grant, bless you, sorry. Um, but each and every college makes their own determination, and the formula for need starts with the sticker price of the school. So you could find yourselves not qualifying for need-based aid at the University of Minnesota, but totally qualifying at St. Thomas. Right? So it's important to understand that the higher that sticker price goes, the more likely you will be need-based. So when you fill out a FAFSA, uh, lots of people want to try and figure out, how can we make ourselves need-based? What if I did this, will we be need-based? Right? There's a lot of mental gymnastics around trying to become need-based. The formula is the formula. You will either be need-based or you will not. Right? And we'll talk about what you do if you're not here in a second. But for the purposes of FAFSA, you should just know that students' assets are assessed at a 20% rate, where parent assets are only actually assessed at 5.64%. So if you have money being saved for college in an UGMA or an UTSMA account, and if you don't know, just ask your financial advisor, those actually get assessed at that much higher rate of 20%. So your money's in essence going not quite as far four times less as far as it, if it sat in a 529 plan or CoverDell or some other savings vehicle um, that only assesses at 5.64% because 529 plans are considered a parent asset, not a student asset, and so assessed at that very small amount. And sometimes people say to me like, oh, I can't believe we saved for college because now we're just being ripped for it, right? Nope. If you have money sitting in a 529 plan and you've been saving, it's been growing over the years, right? And that accrued interest over time is gonna far outpace that little tiny 5.64%. Also think about how much of a 529 plan is intended for college. What percentage? 100, right? <laughs> That's what it's for. That's what it's there for. 
And still, it's only getting assessed at that little tiny 5.64%. So saving for college, good. So as a middle school parent, feel pretty safe. <laughs> um, there are two big mistakes that we see that people make around their FAFSA that end up costing them money. The first is that they assume that assets are the biggest influencer here. They are not. Your income, so your assets being assessed at this little teeny tiny 5.64%, your income assessed at 47%. So unless you plan to quit your job for the purposes of college, um, you really can't manipulate a FAFSA like we will. The other big mistake that we see that people make is they assume assets mean all assets and it does not. You do not want to include your retirement accounts on that FAFSA and you do not want to include the value of your primary residence. But if you're one of those Minnesotans lucky enough to have a cabin up north somewhere, you do have to include that. I can't say this enough. Parent income is the single largest impact on the FAFSA. Single largest. So anytime we talk about need-based aid and we get into the numbers, people already start running. You should see when I present to financial advisors. It's hysterical. Because you can watch their brains start to work. <laughs> they're trying to come up with ways that their clients could be need-based. Um, the reality is, if your household income is higher than about 280,000 adjusted gross, you are not going to be need-based in the U.S. at any school in the country, period. If you're under that, guess what? You are likely to qualify at a lot of schools in the country. But the question is really not, do I get need-based aid or not? The question is, after need-based aid gets applied, can we still afford this school, right? Because if we go back to our big list of schools, NYU at 90,000, so let's say you qualify for $5,000 of need-based aid at NYU. Congrats, it's now $85,000 to send your kid to NYU. You know, it's not moving needles necessarily. So um, a more important question to answer in your household is, what do we actually want to pay for a college education? What is that number? And then you need to know how can the school help us get there, right? But come up with your number first, not the other way around. Can, yep. can you take questions now? Yep. Because um, when you have $100,000 per year, so it's 400 grand, let's say, for four years, how, how are people paying that off? And because that's the question that I'm going through with my son, because my son likes Michigan and out of state is 80 or 70. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's like, yeah, great, but Minnesota and Wisconsin and other ones mm -hmm. are a lot less. Yeah. So that's, I, I, don't, I don't know, because I'm, I'm trying to think you're not going to get paid three or four times the salary, right? I mean, no. <laughs> that's correct. Um, that's correct. So um, at the end of the day, the people who go to those schools, tend to be, so 34 times more likely to be someone from the top 1% income earners in the US, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the people that go to those schools can foot the bill, but a lot of people qualify for need mm -hmm. at those schools, right? So if you can get in, which is the first hurdle, <laughs> right? We had a student this year um, get accepted to Tufts, which doesn't sit at 90,000, but they're at like 80. That student got $40,000 of need-based aid at Tufts. And their family, uh, it's two household income, right? They probably make 150 grand a year or something like that. Um, so then the question is, are you guys comfortable with $40,000? Um, and they had ways to come up to pay for the $40,000, right? They had an inheritance and other things. But we would start with the concept of identify academic fit, identify social fit, and identify financial fit. And if you are not um, in the mood to pay $72,000 or whatever Michigan is paying, then it should not be on the list. Um, because to your point, um, you are gonna have to pay cash, right? Maybe, maybe Michigan comes up with $500 of merit aid, because they're a public institution. Um, they're not a good gifter. So now great, 71.5, you know. Um, and you are not gonna get need-based aid at Michigan because need at the public schools is filled by the state. 
And so the state's not going to cover need for non-tax paying citizens, right? That's not a thing. So you will actually pay that 71,000. And so you do have to have the conversation. Like, look, you go to the U, same education, the exact same education, right? And you are not more likely to earn more coming out of Michigan than you are out of the U. You just aren't. But diving deeper into what's there, because there might be other schools that fit that bill, right, that can get you to those numbers, and we'll talk more about that here as we get there. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So when it's like they're pretty comparable school-wise, why is there such a price difference? Like, how do they get the numbers that they get to for these colleges? Or it's like, not, like they're going to get the same job. Yep. Is it like, you know, name brand versus not name brand? Yeah, so um, I always liken college to cars. What does a car do for you? It gets you from point A to point B, right? And some people need to drive the Porsche, and some people need to drive the Chevy Malibu. <laughs> you know? They both get you around, right? Um, so some people like that branding. Mm -hmm. Other people are just fine with the education because at the end of the day, the outcome's the same. And what I would say is, um, so I did a presentation for advisors around the ROI of college, and one of the things we talked about was, is it worth it to go off to one of the Ivies or Ivy-like schools, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the short answer is, it depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to be um, in politics, like um, a legislative body, if your goal is to be a CEO of a company, if there are um, companies that only recruit out of the Ivies that you're interested in working for, or you want to be a Supreme Court justice, then it's important to go off to the Ivies. But if you're not those people, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if you both get hired for the same job and one of you went off to MIT and the other of you went off to the Colorado School of Mines and you both get hired for the same job, guess what? You're making the exact same money. So um, I think it's important. Um, we would never tell people don't go pay those prices because some people need to drive the Porsche, right? It matters to them. Mm -hmm. If that's not you, then I would say there are lots of good options on the table because the U.S. has 3,000 schools. That could be one of them. <laughs> and there are great schools. Um, the one thing, and I usually talk about this later, but I'll do it now, is acceptance rate and rigor are not the same thing. Right? Rigor is about intensity of the programs and the outcomes of the programs. Acceptance rate is about marketing. It's their marketing engine. Right? So the more applications I bring in as a school, the lower our acceptance rate goes and the more selective I will. And people think I'm amazing if we're selective. And so we can leverage that to get more applications, drive down our acceptance rate. And we're going to talk more about how that's working right now in the trends area. So let's talk about some FAFSA changes. 2024 rolls out the most significant FAFSA changes that we have seen in more than 30 years. And so I just want to make you aware of what they look like. Um, I mentioned already expected family contribution retiring in its place student aid index. The biggest change coming to the FAFSA is the formula is no longer going to recognize when you have multiple kids in college at the same time. So the way this worked before is families who had two kids in college at the same time often qualified for need-based aid when they didn't, when they, then be, when they just had one. And then I stumbled over that. So if you had one kid in college and didn't qualify, a lot of families qualified once two kids went. This was our family all day long. Five kids, right? We had two kids in college over six years. <laughs> so uh, the years that we had overlap, we qualified for need-based aid at the schools we were at. Um, the formula is not going to take that into account anymore. So the way it used to work, you fill out student A's FAFSA, and you say, I have two kids in college, and the formula would go, oh, okay, great. Then we'll just assess your income at 23.5%, and you fill out student B, and oh, same family, okay, great, 23.5% over here. So still 47% of your income, but split between your two students. The way the new formula works, student A, you have two kids in college, well, that's cute. 47% assessment, student B, 47% assessment. So in essence, they're assuming, right, the number that's represented there is 94% of your income can go off with your kids to college. That's what you should be able to afford. 
which is a ridiculous number, right? If you have three kids in college, it's more than you make, <laughs> which is ridiculous, right? But it is how the numbers are gonna work now. The formula around divorce has also changed. Um, only one parent filled out the FAFSA when you have a divorce scenario. Um, in 2024 and going forward, it will be determined by which of the parents financially supports the student more. It's self-reported, so do the best you can in determining who that is. Um, there were some exemptions built in for farming and for small businesses. Those are going away, they're retired. Um, now, if you have a small business, you will need to put all of your assets on the FAFSA. That would include buildings, unsold merchandise, inventory, anything that's just hanging around as an asset, including checking and savings. If you have a services-based business, not such a huge deal, but it would include still your checking and savings for the business. And then um, this is probably one of the few positives that came out of these FAFSA changes. Third parties, I have grandparents here, but it could be an aunt or an uncle or anyone like that. Third parties can now help your student pay for college and it will not impact the outcome of their FAFSA. So um, it's just good to know um, that if grandma and grandpa want to help out, they can do so, and it's not going to have any impact on your student whatsoever. Questions about these? I know, this is the most depressing part. I promise you it gets better. <laughs> I promise. All right, let's do our last quiz. Uh, what school path is the least expensive, do you think? Is it choosing a four-year school? Is it starting at a two-year and transferring to any kind of four-year? Is it starting at a public college and transferring to a private college? Or is it starting at and finishing at a four-year private university? So who thinks uh, choosing the four-year public? A couple people, three, okay. How about starting at a two-year and transferring? Okay, a couple people. How about starting at public and going to private? Nobody thinks that's a good idea. We talked about that already. <laughs> good, you're listening, that's good. How about starting out and finishing out a four-year private? Nobody, okay. Turns out, they all could be true, right? There was no one right answer there. Today, the landscape looks really different. So it is really important to get out of your head that going to a public institution is gonna be cheap and private schools are gonna be expensive and that's just the way it is because it is not the way it is. The way that the landscape works now, and here's what I see every single day in my job, families are over here playing on the college land game board that's on the table and cardboard and we've got parts and pieces and dice to roll, right? <laughs> over here the colleges are playing on the video version and it's fast and it's slick and it goes by different rules, right? So don't be over here at the game board. It's true that transferring can be expensive, but that would be true as well from the two year to the four year. It just depends, right? In the state of Minnesota, we're really lucky. There's actually a relationship that's been developed between our two-year community colleges and the Minnesota State Universities, right? That does not include the University of Minnesota. Um, so that relationship could make that less expensive, but not true in Kansas, right? So if you're a family in Kansas, that's not true at all. Um, it is also true that some schools are allowing a ramp through. Um, the UC system is like this. They can't put any more freshmen on their campuses. Most of their campuses are maxed out and they have no place to build, right? So instead they're starting to, um, kids in the two year and it's an auto accept into the UC system if you get a certain GPA. So there are states where that's the case, but there are also states where that's not the case. And so today it's really important to investigate all of your pathways to figure out which might be true for your student. Today, colleges are flexibly priced and inflexibly priced. And it's important to think about them that way because there are public and private schools on both sides. It makes it more confusing, it's true. It was so much easier when public schools were cheap and private schools were expensive. But it's just not how it works today. And so a great college list today is almost always made up of public and private schools. I'm gonna give you some examples. So we talked about one, University of Michigan, right? If you wanna to go to the University of Michigan, you get to call it the U, you get to wear a big M on your chest, 
and you get to pay $72,000 for that experience if you're from the state of Minnesota. But if you want to go to Eastern Michigan or Oakland, which is also one of their publics, they don't do in-state, out-of-state. Everybody goes for the same price. Everybody goes for in-state pricing. Arizona State has the Barrett School. It's an honors program. If you apply to and get into that, it comes with a $20,000 scholarship that brings their out-of-state pricing to in-state pricing. And there are little spotty programs like that all over the country. On the private side of the house, it's true, if you want to go to NYU, you're going to pay 90 grand a year, unless you're need-based, and probably everyone in the room is. <laughs> I'm not going to make presumptions about what you make, but lots of people find themselves need-based at that price tag. Um, however, if you are interested in Duquesne, in Pittsburgh, you'll probably pay anywhere from twenty-six to 35000 a year at that private school. Right? So it's important today to just think differently about this. You've got to explore all your options. So let's talk scholarships, because what I find is that parents have a tendency to think about scholarships as some magic box where if I can just unlock it, we've got it made. Right? So let's talk about where scholarships come from. The first place scholarships come from are the colleges themselves. They are the single largest provider of scholarship dollars. That's why it's top of the list. That's why it's the biggest. This is going to be a pyramid that gets smaller as we go. Right? When schools give away money, they give it in the millions. Last year, we worked with about 200 seniors last year. They garnered more than $23 million in scholarships from the schools they applied to. Right? So thinking about who is my student and what schools would be interested in my student is the best way when you can marry those two things. That's how you maximize your scholarship dollars. And when schools give away money, it does typically last all four years. Colleges are also number two on the list. So when your student gets accepted, they'll get an email, says congrats, you're a bear, a beaver, go for a duck or some other woodland creature. Mm -hmm. And in that email, there is a link to additional scholarship dollars. Why do kids miss this money, do you think? You know your kids. How often are they sitting in their email just waiting for emails to come by, <laughs> right? If the schools text kids, text kids with this, they get it in a heartbeat, right? But they don't, they send it by email, and by the time the kids open that email, the deadlines have passed. Some of them are in December, and most kids don't even go looking until they haven't seen an acceptance sometime in February, right? So it's important to be watching email. And again, when the colleges give away money, last for four years. So colleges are number one and number two. Third on the list are local scholarships. Should your students be applying to these? Sure. Are they gonna change the price tag for you substantially? No, right? These are the, congrats, you won $200, here's $400, here's another 100 bucks, right? You manage to scrape together $1,000, congrats, you bought books, right? If you're going to the U at 32,000, it's not moving the needle, it just isn't. And classically, these local scholarships last about a year, and then they go away. And the studies are really clear, kids don't go looking when they are sophomores. That money is just gone and you're done, right? So way better to research your schools, figure this stuff out, look at your schools. That's where the price reduction is actually coming from. And then bottom of the barrel where I would recommend you spend zero amounts of time is looking at the magic box on the internet <laughs> of scholarship dollars. It's a terrible idea, it's a huge waste of time. The average student has to apply to somewhere between 50 and 80 of these. Think about the time involved in that. To win, 500 bucks, right? Your kids would be better off just getting a job summer before they go off to college. They'd earn way more. So don't spend your time on the internet, at least researching scholarships. If you're gonna spend time on the internet, research your colleges. All right, so what are you looking for then? If schools are the source, what are you looking for? The first thing you need to look for is, do they actually even offer merit aid? Right. If the school has a low acceptance rate, anything under 30%, really, there is no money to be had there because there's no incentive. Right? Think about this. If I have so many applicants that I have an acceptance rate 
of 6%, 10%, 11%, 17%. Where is the incentive for me to give away money? I don't have to give away money, right? People are bashing down my doors to come to me. And that's what you see at the NYUs of the planet, right? U Chicago, Northwestern, Rice, Duke, Stanford, all the Ivies, right? Um, University of Michigan, because they have a reputation. Right? They don't have to gift people money when kids can't wait and they're bashing in your doors. So look for schools where the acceptance rate is over that 30%, and this is usually where I bring up, oh, we talked about it before, rigor and acceptance rate, not the same thing, because your kids are gonna tell you it is. <laughs> but it's not. All right, so once we know they give away merit dollars, what are we looking for? Well, the first thing you wanna look for are schools where your student's GPA is slightly above the incoming average. Sometimes parents get like, oh, I have these kids, I just had average kids, right? Um, you don't have to have a 4.0 kid. You just have to look for schools where their GPA comes in right around or just above the average. True for test scores as well, and we're gonna spend more time talking about test scores here in a sec. Extracurricular talents matter, but there is no magic perfect mix, right? More is not better here. Passion is better, right? So figure out what your kid enjoys, what they love, what they like to do, and go deeper with that thing, right? So if they're gonna volunteer, and they love sports, find a way to help them volunteer through sports. Right? They don't need to go join Glee Club. If you've got the chess mate, or excuse me, the chess champion of your high school, they do not need to have a sport. I think it's important. There's no perfect mix. There's a lot of advice out there that's just bad. Um, the perfect mix is who is my kid? That's the perfect mix. And then who is gonna be interested in that student? It is myth that colleges want well-rounded kids. They do not. They want a well-rounded campus, which means I've gotta have this kind of kid, and this kind of kid, and this kind of kid, and this kind of kid, right? You can't make an orchestra if everybody's a clarinet. And then be demographically interesting. This is so easy to do. And most people, including myself, cut ourselves off from this, right? I told my kids when we started our college searches, I don't care where you guys go as long as you say, I'm gonna stay in Minnesota, go to the state school, right? I was that parent, I got it. Um, you are demographically interesting if you step over Wisconsin and look further afield, right? Most of Minnesota kids stay in the state or touch a border state, 74%. So, you know, they don't get a lot of applicants at University of New Hampshire. It's okay to look further afield, and in fact, in a lot of cases, that will reduce your cost. So let's take a look at how schools give away money. This is the recipe card from one school, but it's a really common recipe card, or I wouldn't bother to share it. So I want you to pay attention to the categories, not to kind of the word amounts, if you will. Demonstrated interest. This is a school's perception of how interested your student is in them, right? If I'm an admissions group, I've got this stack of kids I've interacted with, from an application perspective, or I've got this stack of kids I've never even heard of before, where am I starting, right? Probably here. <laughs> and those kids gonna get more money, because if they've toured, they follow us on social media, they can't go to our alumni event, I think I have a pretty good shot at bringing this kid in and putting them in a chair, and so they sweeten the pot. Encourage those kids to come our way instead of to the other schools you're looking at, who probably look a lot like us. Look at this, if you live out of state at this school, the rarer kids getting up to 15 grand. So it's important to look further afield. It is not more expensive to leave your state in all cases. Only if you wanna to go to Michigan. <laughs> or Colorado, by the way, or um, any of the UC schools. Um, every A on the transcript gets some money, every rigorous class, an excellent letter of recommendation, and a test score, all of that bringing money to the table, right? So what are they looking for here? They're looking for kids who are gonna be successful on their campus at the end of the day, so they're trying to attract those stronger students. Really, they just want kids that they aren't gonna to have to put on academic probation after semester one, right? We want successful students on our campus. 
So they're in essence paying for that. Um, just to fill out your financial aid form does not matter what the outcome is. This school is a CSS profile school, so they're bringing money to the table because the information in those documents is so important to them. Today, the college is very anxious about who can pay their bills. And so filling out those forms matter, fill it out. The new form, super straightforward, really hard to screw up. Um, so fill out your forms. Should you always fill it out even though it's like yep. easy to type in? Yes, yeah, we highly recommend. So a um, couple things we've seen behavior-wise out of the schools the last couple years. Kids not getting packages because parents did not fill out FAFSAs. Kids not getting accepted when we thought, this kid's a shoe in right, totally should. Not that we can't be wrong, but we saw all these other kids with the exact same profiles, right? <laughs> and these guys all got in and this one didn't. And the only thing that was different was this parent did not fill out their financial aid form. So highly recommend. Also, if you want to take advantage of that federal student loan program, you have to. It's the application for the loan. And everybody qualifies for that. And then a really well-written essay can be worth up to eight, nine, ten thousand additional scholarship dollars depending on the school. Um, it is not a check the box moment. We spend a lot of time helping our kids think about what they're going to write before they start writing because it's super important today for acceptance and super important for scholarship dollars. <coughs> All right, my second tip testing still matters today. Um, yes, the world is test optional. That does not mean the schools don't care, right? Test optional simply means, student, if you don't wanna send it, you don't have to. But it doesn't say anything about how the schools are gonna address that if you don't, right? So let's talk about how to think about this. Um, today, SAT, ACT makes no difference. The schools do not care which of the two tests the kids take, so take the test that plays to the student's strengths. And the best way to figure that out is a practice. <coughs> um, the PSAT this fall going digital, and it will remain digital now forever. Um, it won't even have a fill in the blank option. The SAT, same thing, after first of the year, the SAT will be digital. The ACT is staying old school, so the ACT, ACT will still stay fill in bubbles. Um, the one thing I'm going to say is if your student's going to take an SAT once it goes digital, important to get them test prep that fits that digital test, right? Um, don't have them doing prep for the fill in the bubble test because they're different, they work differently. The SAT actually evolves as the student takes the test. So it'll figure out like how is the student scoring well and it brings more of the student's learning style into the test itself so it evolves as it goes. You need to be able to prep for that kind of test. That's very different than a um, stagnant test that's filling in the bubbles. Um, highly recommend that you get prep. Um, there's some very inexpensive prep online. They are competing against kids who have. So help your kids out. Um, the least effective prep is buy the books and trust that your student's just doing the work in their room. <laughs> right? um, we don't see big leaps in scores in kids that are doing their own prep through the books. Online, individual, small group, all those are very effective. Questions? Okay. And then um, you've got to make decisions about sending the test after you get your test results back. So both um, tests when you register for ACT or SAT, it prompts you about 300 times. Oh, you didn't put any schools in. Hey, we noticed you didn't put any schools in. Hey, student, don't save this until you put some schools in. But you know what? If you put in schools and then your kid goes off and takes that test and they feel miserable and they didn't sleep well and they bomb that test, that goes off to the schools you sent it to. And those schools cannot unsee that test. So I don't recommend that they fill in their schools until they know they're done taking the test. And then you can make decisions about whether you want to send it in because maybe they're applying to a test blind school and there's even no option there. So um, make those decisions and then you can decide if you want to send the test back. Two questions. So the, the, on that latter point, are you saying get the results back and then? Correct. So if you have good results, only then submit to school? Correct. Okay. And then the second one is I've heard in the past ACT is Midwest, SAT is East Coast. Is that no longer? Correct. No okay. longer. Okay. Yeah. 
um, way back in the day. And the reason that's true is the ACT was developed by a company in Iowa. So they ran around and sold it all over the Midwest, right? And the SNMB schools on the coast were like, we're not doing that dumb test. SAT's been around forever. But um, SAT had this major faux pas in the early aughts around um, sending test scores and we're sending like other people's test scores for this student. You know, it was, it was a hot mess. And so lost a lot of their own uh, legitimacy. And so now the schools actually, they've worked hard to rebuild their reputation. And so now the schools really accept all of them and they look at them equally. So, you know, the SAT does not have a science component. If your kid is thinking science, ACT is a better test. It gives them another touch point for demonstrating rigor in that area. So um, you want to think about this a little bit more carefully. All right, so let's talk about some of the trends impacting college. The test optional landscape started as um, a, uh, what are we gonna do? Kids can't get test scores, and so schools went test optional. Now there are about a thousand schools prior to COVID who were already test optional. So these are schools that decided that a singular test is not the uh, single largest success factor we could be measuring, right? Um, however, with COVID, when kids could not get tests because the sites were closed, um, about 800 more schools. So it almost doubled overnight. Um, now we're seeing schools starting to step back in. A lot of the public institutions, Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, Tennessee, Indiana, all stepping back into that space. I'm sure a lot of schools will follow. Um, the thing about the test optional thing, it started as kind of a kindness or a necessity because there were no tests to send has become a great marketing engine for the colleges. And so they've noticed like, hey, when we stay test optional, guess what? We get more applications. And when we get more applications, that drives down their acceptance rate and they look more selective. So it's actually driven this new engine. And what's happened is the tier two schools, these would be schools like Boston College, BU, Northeastern, Tulane, um, Case Western, Wake Forest. What we've seen are their acceptance rates cut in half simply by the sheer volume of applications they are now getting because of, they have remained test optional. So um, it's been um, a boon for the schools. <laughs> and you can imagine, if you have a ton of applications, there's not much incentive to give away money anymore, right? So if my acceptance rate went from 28% to 14%, I don't have to give away money anymore. So we're seeing scholarships dry up at those schools. The other thing we're seeing is they are leaning into early decision, which is the next bullet point here. There are a lot of schools now leaning into that committed decision on the part of the student early in the process, right? And don't just think these are those big brand schools, St. Olaf sits in this space, right? St. Olaf does early decision one, early decision two, and regular decision. There is no early action option. Right, so early decision says to the school, I love you so much college, that if you let me in, I will pay whatever price you tell me, and I will withdraw all of my other applications. So just be clear, when you apply ED, that's what you're telling them. Now, is there good reason to sometimes? Sure, Wake Forest took 58% of their freshman class out of early decision, 58%. And they weren't gonna give you money anyway, right? Because they were one of the schools where all their scholarships have dried up. So if you can foot that bill, sure, apply early decision because you weren't losing anything in the process. Just make sure that that is your student's love, love, love school. Um, so I have a question. So my daughter, uh, she's a senior, she got accepted to South Dakota State mm -hmm. and she just also got early decision. So they want her to make an early decision too. So are you saying it's, not good to make this early decision or to to wait? So um, it's up to her, right? right. If she, she wants to go to the school. Okay, so th if this is the school that she really wants to go to, and in South Dakota State's case, you're not really missing any money, yeah. right? They weren't gonna give you any money anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's no downside to it for your family. I would do it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Where it comes, uh, where there's downside is when that the school is now gonna change their mind about what they might have given you for money because you put all your eggs in a single basket because mm -hmm. they're not worried about losing you then, mm -hmm. right? And that's where you need to keep your leverage. Mm -hmm. So in her case, I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. 
you might be giving up 500 bucks, maybe. <laughs> you know. um, the other thing that's happening is the complexities to get into schools are a lot greater too, right? So again, for the schools who sit under 30%, they are expecting really interesting things sitting on kids' applications, not the traditional things that high schoolers traditionally do. Right? One of our kids created an app that's now available on your um, app, um, on Apple's um, app site and Google's app site, right? That you can download, help you manage your finances. One of our kids created a non-fungible token. Um, these are eyeball-popping projects. Don't ask me to explain any of them because I don't understand. That's the kind of thing that if you want to get into a Michigan or an MIT or a UPenn, you've got to have that stuff on there. It is not enough to be smart today. Um, secondary factors are influencing acceptance. So again, things like um, the rigor level of the transcript, things like um, the um, interaction with the school, demonstrated interest is helping make decisions, the essay is helping make decisions, all of those parts and pieces, they're not check the boxes anymore. It's important to get them done. And then I get a lot of questions around like, hey, we heard about the cliff during COVID and nobody's going back to college and blah, blah. Um, it's not what we're seeing. So as of right now, I'm sure there will be a change in a few years, but as of right now, we're seeing eight to 16% increases in tuition. The U just announced they're gonna do a 13% tuition hike next year. So we don't see the trend for down <laughs> right now. Maybe it's coming, but we, for the foreseeable future, the prices continue to climb. Um, good news, right? You guys look so depressed. <laughs> um, you can make college more of a business choice, right? The colleges are thinking about it that way. And in doing so, you're building your scholarship package. So if you're here because you have a student who is a freshman, a sophomore, or a junior, you've got time to change the landscape, right? So thinking about things like high school course selection. Um, that is not to say send your kid into the AP classes if they're gonna drown in those, right? Not every kid is ready for that. But if they are ready, better to take those and have a slightly lower GPA than to take basket weaving and all the easy versions of my class so that I can have a 4.0 the schools are comparing rigor, right? So start to make this more of a business decision, the colleges are. Assure the school teaches like your student likes to learn, right? One of the biggest mistakes I made as a mom, I mentioned one of my kids didn't go to school. I didn't know at that time, I wasn't, I didn't work for College Inside Track, I'd never heard of college consulting. Um, I didn't know there are schools that teach hands-on, four-year universities that are hands-on learning experiences. So think about how your student learns best and then go seek out those experiences because they're out there. The schools have different learning philosophies. They are not monoliths. It's not all butt in chair, lots of lecturing, lots of note taking, final at the end. Look at multiple programs available. I sat down with a family last spring. This woman in my, um, one of the classes I take at Lifetime stopped me and she's like, I heard you do college stuff. And so we sat down with her daughter, and when I asked her daughter why she wanted to go to XYZ school, she could not tell me beyond, well, it's cool and it's far from home, <laughs> right? I wanted to know, like, what programs are there that you're interested in? And she said, well, I wanna go to law school. Okay, great. What programs are in this school that you're interested in? Because <laughs> law school comes after, right? Um, and so she did have stuff there, but she hadn't given it a lot of thought yet, right? She was hoping to do something in human rights. Um, and so we talked about looking at things like the backgrounds of the professors, the research that's getting done. Dive deeper. And then the big brand schools just need more. I mentioned this already. I mentioned this so many times because I sit down with people who have the really smart kid and they have all these schools they're interested in and they're all non-scholarship schools, and the student hasn't done anything extraordinary, and they wanna pay $30,000 a year, right? So all the things have to come together. They have to. And my last tip, create a family philosophy for how you're gonna pay for school. 
what is your strategy and what's the philosophy? And I mean higher than like, oh, we've got X amount saved, right? What I mean is create the strategy that says, here's where money is coming from to pay for college all four years, right? So this would be a great conversation for your son, right? It's gonna cost X. Here's what we're gonna contribute. So define expectations. Here's what we plan to bring to the table, if anything, as parents. Right? We've got a grandma involved or an auntie involved. Talk about what they're going to bring to the table. And then what are your expectations for the student? Do you want them to have skin in the game? And what does skin look like? Um, talk about it early in the process. This is how you avoid touring the Porsche when what you want to pay for is a Chevy Malibu. Okay? It's important to have that conversation so everybody is on the same, um, in the same place. All right, a little bit about us, and then I'll take your questions. Um, college is an industry, right? You guys are going to do college search maybe two times, maybe three, if you're me, five. Um, we did this 200 times last year, right? Our senior class was 200 kids. There are so many moving parts and pieces today. People leave money on the table routinely. When I talk to those people, it was spring of senior year. <laughs> when someone says, you should call college inside track, except by spring of senior year, I can't help them anymore. Right, because all the work needs to happen on the front side, sophomores and juniors. So we help families navigate the entirety of the college search process. That transfer rate of 38% drops to less than four when we work with families because we're making the kids go deeper, right? We're making people have conversations about the money. We ensure you get the best prices for the school on your list, and we can also ensure the schools that make it to the list fit your budget. So this is my favorite thing we do, right? Um, of our five kids, four are girls. They have all mastered the eyeball rule, and I never get to be as much person in the room. Um, we get to be just a neutral third party, right? Your kids actually do know stuff, but they just don't know that you also know stuff. And so we get to be that kind of middle ground, if you will. So um, I've mentioned this a couple times, bar none, my favorite thing to do are the family consultations. I think high schoolers are amazing. And so I love sitting down with families and sharing college. So what are we going to do? It's an hour long. You're going to bring your student, and I'm going to answer your question. I start with, tell me what you guys want to talk about. And that's what we talk about. Um, we'll talk about academic fit, social fit, financial fit, and I will leave you questions to chew on, right? Some for your student, some for you. Um, I can give you a rough of the outcome of your FAFSA, that student aid index, so you'll know. Do we have this option of being need-based or no, we're just not gonna be. And then um, we can talk about, like even with need, could you afford the schools that you're considering, right? So talking through those options is always good. By the time you're done, you've got some good next steps. So a little bit of housekeeping. I am live and in person. I do these often by webinar, but uh, so no Google form, but there is a form in your folder if you have a sophomore, a junior, or even a senior, and you want to sit down, you want to chat college, let's do that. Just fill out the form, leave it on the table. I'll take it home, and Sonia will reach out my admin and get you on the schedule. Um, your student's too young, all good, right? Um, if you want, still fill out the form. We'll reach out second half of sophomore year. That's usually the time kids are ready for this conversation. Um, and don't worry, we're not going to barrage you ahead of time. We don't have time for that. We're a really small company. No spamming. Um, do follow us on Facebook, though. Um, very good information on our Facebook page. We put things out there like, hey, you have an art kid. Do you want to know what a great art portfolio looks like? There's a great article that outlines what a great art portfolio looks like. So check out our Facebook page. Um, oh, share with some people. <laughs> If you join tonight, it's because you have high schoolers. Feel free, right, to tell your friends, your family. I'm happy to chat college with anybody. It's a no strings conversation. Um, I got involved in College Inside Track because it matters to me. It drives me crazy how the college industry lacks transparency around acceptance and around how they price their product. And so I'm happy to sit down. you don't feel as depressed as you all look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it 
is a lot of information. I can appreciate that. For sure. Do you feel like you got what you came for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, um, one question. Yeah. Um, we talked, you talked a lot about like um, scholarships and stuff. Yes. Like, what about loans? Yeah. Like, we don't really talk about that. Like, is that, I mean, yeah. something. Let's chat loans. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I'm going to pull a sheet up quick, because I can, because this technology is so cool. <laughs> look at, I mean, you, you look at numbers like they are, and you're like, how are you going to be able to do this without any loans? It seems impossible. Yes. Um, I will say for most people that loans do usually have to be part of it, but what I would also say is... Um, that you, you don't need to be drowning in debt if you make the right decisions, right? <laughs> if you build your budget, figure out what it is, and then find schools that can hit your budget. Um, so we think about loans basically in four categories. You start up here and follow your way around. <laughs> um, the federal direct student loan, um, it's actually at 5.5%. Um, the loan sits at 5%-ish, um, and you get it automatically offered to you as long as you fill out your FAFSA. So it'll be built into your daughter's financial package. Um, and then the student has to go in and say, I accept. And with this loan, so freshman year, she'll get access to $5,500. Sophomores get access to $6,500, and juniors and seniors $7,500 each year. So when you hear about people drowning in debt, they are not doing it through the federal loan program. That's the same for every student? Every student, Okay. correct. Okay. What changes student to student is how much of the loan has interest being subsidized while the student's in school. So the college has the discretion, and the college makes this decision. You guys don't get to make it. The college has the discretion to split a student's loan if they are need-based on their campus, and they get to decide how much is subsidized. It cannot exceed $2,000 less than the total amount they're offered. So the most a freshman could get of subsidized is $3,500, and then they would get $2,000 unsubsidized if they maxed out the, the subsidized amount. So on their financial award, that's what it would look like. It would say sub, fed sub, or sometimes it uses the whole loan subsidized, um, and then they would have an ad sub amount. Um, you get to choose. So we did get to split that, right? And my kids only took out the subsidized amount, which meant while they were in school, it was 0%. It only started accruing interest after they graduated. Um, so every kid gets access to that money, every single student, you just have to fill out your FAFSA. If your kids go on to do um, nonprofit work, so if they're going into the healthcare industry, for instance, most of our big healthcare systems are nonprofits. Um, if they work for the government, they go into the services, all of those um, give them the opportunity to um, get public service loan forgiveness, but you have to set the loan up right on the back side. So when it's time to start thinking about the repayment plans, I always recommend people align with someone who understands those public service loan forgiveness options. It's an entire industry. We don't do that work, but um, it's important to know the time you make that decision is during the student's senior year of college. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have enough through the federal direct, I would look at your state option. In the state of Minnesota, we have a state loan. It's called the Minnesota Self Loan, MN Self. Today it sits at 6.35%. That 6.35 is the fixed rate. There are variable rates available, and the student gets up to $20,000 a year access. So for most families, that takes care of what you would need to pay for college. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you start thinking about loans, some good back-in-the-napkin math. For every $10,000 the student takes out, the rough payback on that is about 100 bucks a month for 10 years. So if they max out their federal direct loan, that's $27,000, they'd have roughly a $270 a month loan payment for 10 years. So as you're working with your student on how much loan is too much loan, 
right? If you use an average starting salary of $40,000, because that's what four-year grad starting salaries look like today, unless you're like an engineer, right? Then they're going to be more. Um, you don't really want to go beyond in four years that starting salary. So if a starting salary for your student's going to be roughly $50,000 in your field, you don't want to take out more than $50,000 in loans. And remember, that would be $500 a month for 10 years. So it's just some good, like, get out the monopoly money and help your student understand. They're like, okay, you've graduated. Here's how much you're making a month. I'm going to grab 26% of that because you have to pay taxes, right? And then you have to pay rent, and then you have to do this and this and this, and here's your student loan. So it looks like you're living in our basement. <laughs> and you don't like that, I don't like that. So let's figure this out, right? It's a good way to kind of help them think through this. Because kids maybe, don't know. You can build on that. I mean, I was probably having the same discussion with my son. I mean, because I, I rounded it up to 80, and I always rounded it. Yeah. Only 80 times four, right? I mean, that's like a house, right? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a house mm -hmm. payment. So yeah, if yeah. I'm a bank looking at you, you know, you have your salary, and I see you have $400,000 mm -hmm. in debt, mm -hmm. how much yeah. more am I going to give you at this point to, to put the house in, right? I mean, maybe living in an apartment could be pulled out. It just yeah. uh, sounds like very similar to what you're saying, but I mean, yeah. it's like, I don't see how that math works out. Yeah, that's right. And you actually have to do the math with the kids. Right, because they don't get it. They don't understand. And they also don't understand how that's going to hamstring them. Right, they really don't get it. And that's where I think often, and this is like stepping out of the college inside track space and being more as opposed to a parent, sometimes you have to make good parent decisions, right? And just say, I'm not going to let you do that. Period. Because you don't want your kid. You know, the point of college is to help them launch. So help them launch. Um, the, now, the Minnesota Self Loan can't be used at all colleges around the country. They have a very good appendix on their website that shows all the schools that can use it. Um, it is schools in other states, but not all of them. Um, so you may have to look at private loans. NerdWallet does a very good evaluation of private loans. Um, if you just do student loan NerdWallet, it'll pop right up. They do a nice job of evaluating things like origination fees, that kind of stuff. And then the last option would be not a student loan, but a parent level loan. The federal parent plus loan is a parent loan. Um, so not in your student's name, in your name. This is a relatively expensive loan. The um, interest rate today sits at 8%, so two and a half points higher. <laughs> 275 is what I think it actually is. I gotta fix my number, but um, and then a four percent origination fee. So if you're looking at the Parent Plus loan, if you've already taken out a home equity line of credit on your house, I would look at that first because you've already paid the origination fee, and it's gonna be a loan, your loan either way, right? Your name's sitting on it either way. So regardless of what you choose. Be really clear of the terms because there are some wild loans out there. Discover Bank has this loan. So I don't know if it's still out. It was a couple years ago. 1.3%. Who doesn't want to sign up for that loan? Everybody. But if you don't read the fine print, you don't notice that it jumps to 12% once you graduate. So 1.3% while you're in school, 12 once you graduate. <laughs> so you have to make sure you read the fine print. Because, mm -hmm. like, and yeah, you're, when we were looking at scholarships and then we have a certain amount set aside and she's just like well I'll, I'll take the loan and it was just like just this kind of this flippant attitude yes. about it yep. you know and yep my daughter um, too <laughs> and my husband who's in a different one uh really does think like it is possible to do something like this without any student loans and I'm just like yeah I don't know like it can happen right um the one thing I'll say about state schools is as you go along, the student can pick up scholarships, but they have to be willing to dive in and do that. Mm -hmm. They have to be looking in their department, right, um, in the dean's office for their um, degree. Mm -hmm. They have to be willing to do that stuff. But here's the thing. While it's true that you can do it without loans, not very many do it without loans. Mm -hmm. So we had the kind of, in our household, we were, I was at the like $10,000 that's all you're taking out in debt. Because one of my kids I knew was going to be a dance major. 
Mm. So I was like, even as a dance major, <laughs> even once you graduate and you're working as a waitress, you can make your $100 a month loan for film. Um, and um, all my kids did it. All of them got out with less than $10,000 of debt. One of my kids got out debt free. She was actually at the U. She worked her butt off looking for internal scholarships every single year. Right, so it can be done, but the system most definitely, and we had a small 529 plan sitting over here, right, yeah. that we got to sprinkle across yeah. all the years. Um, the system definitely assumes that you are gonna be contributing to this college education in some way, shape, or form. If you're not actually gonna pay, that you're willing to co-sign on debt, because by the way, I didn't mention this, I meant to, this is the only loan your student can take out by themselves. All these other loans, these require your co-signature, so your name is sitting on the debt too. This one is your loan, right? So it does become increasingly more challenging in the system to get it done. And for families who are like, look, I paid for my education, you're just gonna have to pay for yours. I don't disagree with the sentiment, but it really can't be executed on anymore. Yeah. Along those lines, um, and it's almost philosophical, but of course the things have changed with the tuition and everything being crazy. Uh, how much is reasonable for the kids to pay? Because I, I have two siblings that got money from parents and just blew it all up and then <laughs> failed. Yeah. So it was very intentional for me to say I'm not going to pay you know, 100%. You need to have some skin in the game, as yeah. you said. So what, what's a reasonable... I know it depends on the school and all yeah, that, yeah. but I mean, I want to make sure that they go there knowing that they have... I actually want them to work a little bit so they yeah. have to feel a little bit of that pain so yeah. they appreciate it. Yeah. But is that not fair, or what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I never get into the what's fair or not. What I would say <laughs> is always, like, as a family, you have to figure that out. In my household, so I'll just give you what we did so it gives you a talking point for you to start to figure out what your own thing is. Um, my, my thought was, one, I'm not co-signing on anybody's debt, period, right? So they've got to get through this somehow with the federal student loan program. Um, two, I really don't want, I was flexible on this, I didn't tell them that. I don't want it to be more than 10 grand, the total they take out, right? And three, you've gotta pay a third of your own education. So if you meld all those together, what, it really was, what I was really saying to my kids is, look, you're not going to a school at 60 grand. Because no kid is gonna be able to pay a third of that. 20 grand a year, right? No. So we had to adjust expectations to say, you're gonna go to a school that's roughly the cost of the University of Minnesota. And so when I started with College Insight Track after the first two were kind of down their pathways, that's why I told them, I don't care where my kids go, but it's not gonna cost me more than they know. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, and what I would say about percentages is complete the dial, right? So don't say you have to pay a third, right? It has to be a third of, and then fill in that. So at the end of the day, one of my kids went to the U, one of my kids went to Drake, and one of my kids went to University of Missouri, Kansas City. The most expensive school on that list, by just numbers, was? Duke. Uh, not Duke, Drake. Duke. She went to Drake. Yeah. <laughs> not to Duke. Duke would have been the yeah. most expensive yeah. for sure. The U? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the U was the most expensive, followed by University of Missouri, Kansas City, but there was an $8,000 difference between those two, so significantly less expensive, and Drake University, which ended up being the same price as when I was there. Hmm. So that's why today a great college list really is public and private combined. Because the private schools over the 30% acceptance mark is where the money can go. Because they gotta fill their freshman classes or budgets don't work. And so they're willing to pay for students that they think benefit them. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Um, if you guys have you to go, have, feel free. Oh, if what if you have a student that is going to do a gap year, mm -hmm. like not sure what they want to do, so they're just going to work. And yeah. how does that something like this play into the scenario of that if they take a year off and work and whatever? Yep. Yeah, so um, our recommendation for a gap year is that you don't lead with that. So you do a full college search. Oh, okay. Right. Figure out kind of what is my criteria for school, right? Do the whole thing. Apply to the schools, the whole nine yards. Do not tip your hand. 
that you've been thinking gap year. And then in spring of senior year, you can approach the schools with a deferral. Some schools will defer. They'll defer your acceptance. Some schools will defer acceptance and financial awards, although not as many today as we found pre-COVID. And then some will just say, you have to reapply. Right? So just be prepared for that. But don't tell them before application season that you're thinking gap year. Because as a college, if I think you're not coming, why would I waste my energy on something like that? I have a, a sophomore, and she was uh, very much so just like, has no idea. Yeah. No idea whatsoever what she wants to do. And so she's even thought about, like, well, maybe I'll just do a gap year or whatever. You know? Yeah. The and one thing I would say about that, though, is you can do a college search. The biggest way to shut down a college search is to ask your students, what do you think you want to do? Let's drive the search off that. Because mm -hmm. guess what? No sophomore knows. I sit in front of families every yeah. single day. None of them know. Most of the seniors don't know. So instead, you focus on social fit. Take, relieve the pressure valve off the academic fit piece, right? And start with social fit. Get onto some campuses. What do you think about the school? What are the qualities you like about the school? No pressure in those first tours to even say, like, do I like St. Thomas enough to go here? Um, just go see what it's like. Here are the things I like. Here are the things I don't. So start there, relieve that pressure. Because guess what, there are a lot of schools that do undeclared really well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you see in um, gap years that kids took, so the research on this, pretty straightforward. When the gap year was chosen because they didn't know what they wanted to do, they never go to school. Mm -hmm. Only like 15% of kids ever go back to college, mm -hmm. right? The gap year becomes hard because you've lost all your study skills, it's been a while, <laughs> you know, so um, the transition there, pretty clear. Um, instead, we would look for schools where they're going to help her figure out what that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. There are schools that have programs in place. They expect kids to be undeclared. 80% of kids change their majors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kids go in and mm -hmm. something else are damned, right? So it's okay. So where do you begin with, like, setting up tours for schools? Do you pick, like, small privates, some larger states, like how do you, yeah, how do you start with? Start with schools that are really different from okay. each other, right? Um, and just focus on the social fit piece. Okay. Um, and, you know, go see the U. U is urban, it's massive, it's not overly walkable, mm -hmm. and in fact, if you're um, in a dorm in St. Paul and all your classes are East Bank, you gotta take the shuttle every day, right? Mm -hmm. So you have that conversation, what does that look like if it's negative 10 outside, right? That's mm -hmm. where you start. Mm -hmm. And then go see St. Thomas. They're close to each other, right? Still urban, but in the neighborhoods now. Mm -hmm. um, not so big, 7,000 versus 40,000. So having that conversation, and the only point of this stuff is, what do you like, what don't you like? Mm -hmm. And then maybe go, go see a small Northfield or Collegeville, whatever you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, just have the students start listing things they like and things they don't like. Easy as possible. Some questions, you guys. Um, leave your forms. If you just want a copy of the presentation, no worries. Just check that box. We'll get you a copy of the presentation. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank I hope you. you found it helpful. Thank you.